Thank you very much. In the 150 years since uh, Darwin gave us the origin of species, we humans have made lots of progress in lots of areas. We've split the atom, worked out the growth structure of the universe and its timing. We know how continents move. We've unraveled the structure of DNA and the origin of life pretty much. Uh, we've got a man on the moon and on this planet we've wired up lots of microprocessors forming the internet. So it's pertinent to ask how much progress have we made in paleoanthropology in that period of time. Uh, particularly in answering the most basic question, why are we uniquely bipedal amongst the great apes? Now I had a very good start with Charles Darwin. His uh, carrying model is still very respected today. Uh, but I would put it to you that there's not many uh, seminal landmark papers since then that have really given us a great deal of uh, confidence in understanding this, uh, this, this problem. Perhaps the, 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 the greatest step forward we might think of was uh, given to us by uh, Raymond Dart uh, when he realized that uh, bipedalism preceded encephalization and other human uh, uh, evolutionary features uh, by a large magnitude. But even this took 20 years for the field of anthropology to accept. Uh, if you were looking for other seminal papers that took us a step forward, I'll, I'll put it to you that you'd struggle. The methodologies and, and techniques have improved amazingly well. But in terms of actually answering that question, how much progress have we made? Uh, I think Rodman and McHenry's uh, uh, contribution is worth a mention uh, in, in reminding us that even slow locomotion is obviously a key factor in our evolution. But, you know, maybe I'm being a bit harsh here, but I, I wanted to just make the point that there's a huge literature of different ideas on bipedal origins. This is just a, a, a summary slide for my PhD uh, lit review. And we all have our favourites and we all have ones that we like to poke fun at. But the point is that it's a bit of a mess. I'm not the only person to make this point. I think on a similar platform a few years ago, Kevin Hunt gave a talk entitled The Tangled Thicket of Bipedalism Origin Hypotheses, Embarrassment of Riches, or Just Embarrassment. And I can see where it's coming from. There was recently a, a special issue of the Journal of Anatomy dedicated specifically to bipedal origins. And in one of the papers, there was a conclusion that basically said, maybe it's just more complicated than we thought. And this sort of confusion, I think, is epitomized by the latest offering uh, that re reached the journals on this subject, which made the front page of Science just last year, and that's Crompton and collaborators' uh, idea of this hand-assisted arboreal bi bipedalism uh, that was uh, just just last year. But yeah, I would challenge you to uh, to read that paper and find a single sentence uh, which gives you an adaptive explanation for the divergence between humans and apes. I've written to Robin about this, and he seems to be of the opinion that it might just have been drift. So here we are, 150 years after Darwin, and if you were to look at creationist in the face who was asking you what's the Darwinian explanation for why we walk on two legs, the only honest answer to say based on what's in the literature is we just don't know. Now, we don't know is a legitimate scientific answer to lots of questions, but I think that this is a little bit disappointing, in particular as in the middle of that tangled thicket there was actually a gem of an idea which the whole field of anthropology seems to have gone uh, out of its way to completely ignore for 50 years. Uh, an idea that not only helps explain bipedal origins, but fundamentally everything that's different between humans and chimpanzees. And that is Alistair Hardy's wading so-called aquatic ape. Now, I want to just try to persuade some of you uh, that this idea isn't quite as crazy as maybe you have been led to believe. Uh, and to do that, I'd like to just to get you to do a little thought experiment. Imagine that you've got a group of chimpanzees and you, your task is to come up with experimental conditions using things only from the natural world to induce these chimpanzees to move bipedally and continue to move bipedally for as long as the conditions prevail. Now, uh, to help you, here's an image of a bonobo on the left moving quadrupedally, on the right moving bipedally. And if you think in the same way as me, I don't think it's very difficult. You put them in a tank of waist-deep water, and they will move bipedally for as long as the conditions prevail. They will continue to move bipedally forever, because if they started moving quadrupedally, they would drown. Now, this is the only model of bipedal origins that can say that. It's the only model of bipedal origins that would actually kill you if you started to move quadrupedally. If we look at the extant apes, all four species of great apes do generally move quadrupedally on dry land, and all four very predictably move to switch to bipedalism in shallow water. Now, for me, this alone puts this model of bipedal origins 
head and shoulders above all the others. And this alone should be enough of a justification to be the default thing we teach to students uh, about, uh, in anthropology. But there's more. If you look at the paleo habitats of the earliest bipeds, this image comes from the original paper in AJPA by Johansson et al for the Hadar site, and it's basically a wetland for 1.4 million years. We all have heard, uh, know that the Sapalanthropus site was located slap bang in the middle of Paleo Lake Chad. And even if you prefer a savanna a paradigm for human evolution, we, we mustn't forget that in savannas, trees don't just disperse randomly, they tend to shrink close to permanent watercourses, such as rivers, which seasonally flood. Now, if a student went up to the lecturer at the end of the lecture and said, well, what about this wavy idea? Uh, it's a fair bet that the anthropologist would tell the student that it's been rejected by science. But I would refute that very strongly. Uh, and I would encourage the student to ask the anthropologist exactly where was that rejection made? In the coffee room, a uh, gossip, or was it done in the literature? Because that's normally what we do in science. We do things through the literature. Now, I've, I've done a thorough look review of this subject, and really it's an embarrassingly poor how much uh, attention has been given to this very good idea. Um, uh, most of it comes from a single volume called Road et al., which is not even a peer-reviewed uh, piece of literature, it's just the proceedings of a, of a conference. Uh, and only one paper has ever been published in an anthropological journal to review this idea, and that was John Langford's paper in JHA 97. And what does he have to say about this wading idea? Well, what he does is he selects one little straw man argument out of Elaine Morgan's books and doesn't even contradict it, but in place of it puts his own breakationist idea. Now, this is not a, a rejection. This is not even any discussion. Uh, and so I don't think anthropologists can claim that this idea is rejected. These are the papers, John Landon's paper and Rhoda Tal on the left. Now, when I first got heard about all of this, I was amazed that such a good idea could be ignored completely by an entire field for 50 years. Uh, the number of studies done about the waiting hypothesis is just two, and none of those are in peer-reviewed journals, compared to the thousands and thousands of research projects, grant-funded uh, projects, and expensive uh, equipment that's been done to uh, evaluate the other models. So I thought, well, if you guys aren't interested in this, Maybe a lay person should come back to academia from the outside and do a few studies myself. So that's what I'm trying to do.